I'm Ronnie. I'm Duran. And today we're going to talk about why is it important not to downgrade findings? You know, as we kind of see this a lot, especially in our field, where it, especially, let, let me just say this, a lot of people think that we as penetration testers or security consultants, whatever you want to call it, that we should basically be salesmen. And with that mindset as well, that we want to uh, please the client. So we're going to try to sell them things, but also make sure that they're happy to downgrade things. So, you know, which becomes a really, really big problem here. And, you know, I kind of want to discuss, you know, that Duran, like, why is it important not to downgrade and why we also shouldn't be looked at as, you know, salesmen and how it could affect what we do. I guess, at least to me, let me tackle the salesman one first. It, there's, there, you're right. There seems to be this misunderstanding that we should be able to do marketing. But the there are a lot of problems with that. And the first being most of the people who, many of the people, I should say, who are in this field are of a certain mindset where they are less likely to lie and fluff up uh, things the way that I have to put this carefully and tactfully marketing does, right? So there's a reason why there is a phrase about used car salesmen. I think we all know what a lot of people who do sales, uh, they're, I'm sure they're perfectly fine people. Many of them are very good at interacting with people, communicating and, and schmoozing. That, first of all, doesn't describe a lot of people in our field. A lot of the people in our field right. are really bad at interacting with people who aren't technical, which is its own issue. But but on top of that, they are not especially good at selling products. What they can do is sell their work through their work. And that's the misunderstanding. So I am a salesman in that at the end of the day your sales folks can get a customer to come initially but they can't get a customer to stay my work product can get someone to stay it may not get them to come initially it actually in in my company for example it is word of mouth we don't do any marketing and we turn down people all the time because they get way too many uh, requests and things that I just don't want to do, uh, things that I, I don't think would behoove my, uh, the way people see me, things of that nature and uh, my reputation. So I sit there and we turn people down all the time. And the way that works is the work product. People see what we do. They like what we did for them. They tell their friends, their uh, organizations talk, lawyers talk, schools talk, government agencies talk, all of this stuff. And so you get that reputation and that's how you do it. Uh, that to me is a better way. And that is me as a salesman, but not a traditional salesman. That is me as a salesman who's demonstrating my products in such a way that it makes customers tell their friends and that's us as a salesman what is not us as a salesman is trying to upsell people i can't upsell anyone for the life of me i i can't i won't it, it just won't happen i feel slimy you know yeah it, it is i mean that's that's how you see in the used cars or the car salesman thing like that's how they do that and it does feel slimy it feels like you're trying to you know finesse in some type of way and and that's not a good thing. That's not something I would be happy with if you were trying to pull something over me just to get an upsell or get me to do something. It, it makes me feel like I don't want to work with you guys. If this is how you're going to treat me, you know, and, and that's why I said I don't feel like you, you leave the sales and marketing to the salespeople. That's what they do. You leave the technical stuff that we do with, with us. We're And a lot of us are introverts. Yeah. Like we don't like talking to people. But we have to as a, as a part of our job. But I don't like talking to people. 
you know, especially if you don't understand what you're talking about. Hell, it's a lot of people that's in this industry that are technical or supposedly quote unquote technical and don't know what the hell they're talking about. So it's like, <laughs> what the hell? Like we're not, and I don't consider myself a salesman. I've been in sales before, but I don't consider myself a salesman. And if I wanted to do sales, I would have went into sales. Yes. Yes. You know. Yes. That's my biggest thing. If I wanted to do sales, I would be in sales today. I'm yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think that's something people get. I mean, I understand what, you know, most companies are trying to get at when they're trying to say, hey, we're all salesmen, but we're not. Yeah. You know, we're not. We're not good at it. Yeah. You, you cannot put a penetration tester in and tell them, hey, you're going to sell this product. Yes. We're not salesmen. Yes. You know, that's not our job. <laughs> yes. And you can't put a salesman in a penetration tester role and tell them to go hack some things or test some things. They're not testers. Yes. So yes. So why pretend that we are when we're not? Right. And I wonder how much of this comes from the small team mentality. I come from organizations where a small team is very important. That's really important for a lot of entities where you have to do a, a variety of roles on any given mission and you don't know what's going to go on. So you don't know, are we going to need this skill or that skill? So you, you bring together a small team that happens to be multi-talented each individual so you have that overlap you see that with uh, when they send astronauts into space typically you'll have a few people who can fly a few people who can do this or do that that way you have overlap in case someone gets sick they get injured whatever uh, there there are specialists and usually your specialist is irreplaceable but you typically try to put two specialists on as a result or, or something of that nature. But yeah, we're not, we aren't salesmen and anyone who's read Dilbert would know we're not salesmen. I mean, Dilbert's the classic, you don't stick an engineer in front of the customer and expect them to sell the product. The same is true with us. You don't stick us because a lot of us have that same, maybe this is just because I've been around a lot of engineers throughout my career. So maybe I'm wrong, but my impression is that a lot of the people in this field have an engineer's mindset. A lot of people in computer science have an engineer's mindset. This doesn't mean they're engineers. It, there's a difference. One's a little more logical, one's a little more mathematical. But, but what I mean is from the perspective of, like you said, we're introverted. We feel dirty and don't like to feel dirty when we upsell and when we feel like snake oil salesmen, we're also too honest. Yeah. Yeah. That's what got me a lot, you know, coming from working with engineers as well. And, you know, I, I'm totally honest. I would, uh, even when I was working as a technician, just not an engineer, but I was working as a technician and I'm, I'm doing computer work and I'm, doing electronics as well, fixing these parts. And somebody comes up and they say, hey, you know, they wanted to pay all this money to do something very simple. And I'm like, you know, you could just really just do this yourself. Pop it out, put it in, you're done. Yes. You know, you're going to pay me $200 to do this for you? Doesn't make any sense. Yes. You know, and I always felt like it, I'd rather be honest with you than to try to upsell you, knowing that I could get the money from you. But why not try to teach you so you can learn to do it yourself and not at waste your money? Yeah. And that's probably what got me in trouble a lot and not really upselling and getting sales I needed was because I didn't believe it was worth telling people, hey, you need to like pay me, you need to pay us two or $300 just to put in this part. Right. I mean, or, you know, just blah, blah, blah. Or, hey, you let me, there's a resistor that blown or a capacitor. Let me do this and fix that for you. And it's going to cost you a way more just to, for me, just, I can just pop this thing out, solder it back on and you're good. Well, you could just get a new board. Yeah. It's cheaper to just get a new board and they're going to charge you all this money just to do that simple thing. It just never made sense to me. And I was like, I'd rather tell the truth than to upset. It makes me feel like, like you said, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But the other component to this is, let's say, for example, 
we have a finding and it's a high finding or a critical finding and you're getting that pressure to downgrade that finding for me that violates my integrity and honesty to do that because i know what the consequences are but you'll have people who say no no no, we have to make the client happy yes we want the client to be happy but there's happy short term and there's happy long term and i can actually make the client happier and keep my reputation by going through and being honest and forthright with them. And what, what I prefer to do is to negotiate with the client. And negotiate doesn't mean we're going to downgrade the finding. That's not what I'm talking about. Negotiate means we come up with a compromise where, okay, this is going to be a high because I've tried to explain to you why it's a high or why it's a critical. And maybe I, I've gotten this actually a number of times where I have a high or I have a critical and we get on a call because it's the first thing you should do. When someone is pitching a fit about a finding, the first thing you have to do is get a call because you're not going to solve it through email. You're not going to solve yeah. it through text. No, no, it's just going to sound, especially since you people's what people can interpret things a little bit different through email or text. With stuff like that so it's better to get on a call and have a conversation that way you, everybody can feel the tone and vibe and we can kind of work things out and describe it you even get a very i can even explain things better by talking to you than actually do email so i think that's a lot better and even learn that to you know doing this so many times where you know the client feels one way and especially the way the tone comes off a lot of time clients seem like they're coming off like very, very hostile. But then when you get on the phone with them, you have a call, they, they just had a misunderstanding. They wasn't understanding what was going on. And they're just trying to get things, you know, fixed. I mean, they're humans just like us. Right, right. And once you get on that phone with them, you're able to explain things, like you said, so much better. You're able to, because that communication is really flowing. It's they say one thing, you respond. And you explain whatever is confusing them to help to reduce or mitigate that. And I have found that in most of the cases, people walk away saying, oh, okay, all right, this makes sense. I, I just didn't realize this, this, and this. But I have had instances where instead the client told me flat out, I cannot take a high report to my management. I cannot take a report with criticals to my management. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't show this to a customer. And I, I definitely understand that. But the first thing I always tell them is, I, and I've, I've actually gotten this a lot because even as an auditor where I was doing security audits, assessments, I don't know what they call it now. Anyway, where let's say you're doing NIST or uh, DISSTIGS or what have you. So I'm doing this audit and I have all of these findings. That I can't take a report with this many findings to my management. And I, I say to them, this is actually a good thing because, you know, I, as you're working with these entities, you're starting to get a feel for their frustrations, right? Maybe they feel like they don't have appropriate funding. Maybe they feel like they don't have appropriate hours, appropriate staff, appropriate resources, software, whatever it happens to be. And you, you help them to understand how this is a good thing because it can help them secure the funding that they want and need. It can help them to have that discussion with their management that they haven't had in a successful way because now they can take that report, leverage that report to get the things done that they wanted to be done. That, that's the first step. That's the basic step. It's convincing them that this pill that they don't want to take is going to give them the things that they wanted. It's like if you were a doctor and you had a patient who happens to be incredibly ill and they don't like shots or they don't like pills and maybe you have to give them a shot or you have to give them a pill, what have you. And you convince them, hey, you don't like being sick. 
Nobody likes being sick. You've already told me you don't like the fact that you can't, you know, play with the kids the way you want to. You can't go the places you want to go. It restricts your life. You know, so you're, you're unhappy. Well, this will fix that. It, it's going to suck. You won't like it at first, but you will like the outcomes. That, that for me, has been incredibly successful. And that goes back to negotiation. Mm-hmm. This is the negotiation part. And maybe you can explain further for people who don't understand what that means. Because some people will look at negotiation and think that we are negotiating with the client to lower the severities or lower these things. That is not what we're doing. To, to, re- to restate this, the whole idea here is the findings are the findings. Mm-hmm. Unless they're totally wrong or false positive, which it should have been picked up to QA. Right. But the findings are the findings. It is not on us to to lower the severities because the client doesn't like it or can't take it back and do this it is on them to accept the risk if they don't if they want to or don't like it or whatever it's not on us you can do that on your end and as you said this is an opportunity because a lot of places or organizations and i've been in a lot of them that don't have a good or good security team or funding or they don't care about it and this is a good way to to have that discussion and negotiate especially with your manager or boss, whoever it may be, that, hey, you don't want to have these high findings, just critical findings, and we need more people. We right. need funding. We need to build our security program. That's the only way we can get better because if we don't, we're going – somebody else that – just like you did it, somebody else is going to be able to do it, and it's, we're going to be on the news. Right. And then it's going to be a bigger problem. Right. Okay, That that's spot on. And and one of the really key things here is if you downgrade the findings yourself, you now have become responsible because if they get compromised due to that thing, they can go through and sue you. And not only can they sue you, but let's say data was stolen and that data includes customer data. Maybe it includes employee data. It includes PII. So private individuals information you can then be gone after your company can be gone after your your reputation will be destroyed because this organization and this tester said it was a low or a medium a lower or moderate finding and yet we were compromised because of this therefore they don't know what they're doing therefore it's all their fault i wasn't neglectful i just did what their report said, and I allocated money in accordance with that. So now they aren't getting sued for negligence. You're getting sued for mispractice or negligence and all this other stuff because you failed to do your job. And if it comes out that you downgraded that finding inappropriately, then you will get destroyed in court. And your company or you, the individual, depending on if, you know, it's an LTD or what have you, will be sued into oblivion. Your, uh, like I said, your reputation will be demolished. Instead, what you do, and this is the negotiation part, and you're right, this, this needs to be explained because some people misunderstand it. You sit there and you say, okay, here's the finding. Here are the mitigation steps. And we already have remediation and all this other stuff. If you do this, this, and this, then we can retest it. And this will most likely come out as a medium or a low or whatever. If you do these quick and easy wins, then it's going to knock that severity down. You'll still have the finding, but it will knock that severity down. That is the negotiation. That is, you're actively engaging and working with them so that they understand that if they do these things, then they will get what they want, which is a lower finding. And by explaining to them, hey, you can do these things quickly or cost effectively or what have you, they now have a path forward. So now they can go through, and because you'll retest, that's the report they can hand out to clients or to management or whatever. Does it mean that they maybe have to pay a little extra if they didn't pay for a retest? Yes, but you can limit the scope of that retest to, okay, I'll pay $1,000. If Again, if this wasn't already part of the contract, I'll pay $1,000 and you will, when I'm done, test this again, and then you'll adjust the report accordingly. Well, easy. Everyone's happy everyone's happy that's negotiating 
And, and that's what the remediation testing is for, you know, it's, especially for people who don't want to be able to, you know, want to give the report out to their customers and have the issues that they're going to get back from their customers. Um, and that goes back to, and this is very proven, as Deron is correct, that it even worked, helped me a lot because negotiating with the client to, you know, get the severities to the point that they want it to be by doing those simple, easy wins and giving them some recommendations to do that. And then when we go retest, we can, you know, knock these down or it might disappear automatic period right. if they do everything the right way. And then they can hand out this report and it's a quick turnaround. And that keeps the client happy and wanting to come back because they know that we're going to work with them. Now, as you know, from previous, when you were on this particular client, the reason why it didn't work very well was because there was no negotiation. Right. The one, one team was saying that you guys have these findings and you have to fix them and we don't care. Okay. And it's one thing to say, hey, we're not going to downgrade, but it's another thing not to actually work with the client right. to help them find, you know, figure out a solution to their problem. Right. And that makes the client want to go elsewhere. Right. You know, which is why when you got to it, it was a clusterfuck because the, the team that they were working with didn't want to work with them or negotiate. And right. then even then, I'm not going to just put it on that team. I'm going to put it on the client as well. And they didn't want to compromise. So you have two people not want, willing to compromise. It's clashing, clashing heads, and there's no negotiation there. So now when it goes to the next person, it's already some hostility there because they don't want to negotiate anyway because they felt that the other people didn't want to negotiate and they were just, it was just a hostile type of thing. So right. my thing is for people who don't understand that negotiating with the client doesn't mean that you are settling or telling them that, Hey, we, we're going to drop this down because you said, no, all it means is that we're going to help them figure out a solution to their problem yeah. and give them some recommendations to get to the end goal that they want. Yeah doesn't mean we're settling for anything yeah but you know i think people miss miss you know can screw that and they think that you're saying hey we're you're just going to capitulate no we didn't say that it's not right. what it is right so i think there's one other really important component to this and this has come back to haunt me i wasn't even the one who did it but when you capitulate and downgrade findings inappropriately. Not only do you have legal ramifications, but, and reputational, et cetera, et cetera, because maybe, I mean, you're going to start getting customers who know and think that they can bully you because they will tell their friends, oh, you got a bad report? I know who you can talk to. And they won't fix it. They won't help you fix it. They'll just either not find things or they'll remove them from the report when you complain or they'll downgrade the finding and all this other stuff. What will wind up happening is you will find yourself getting bullied over and over and over again. And you will now have it where they say, oh, but this team always makes this finding a medium. So you need to do it because they do. Yep. I, that, that always irks me because I don't care what someone else rated something. Maybe it was a different system. Maybe the system handled different data. Maybe they're just bad testers. Maybe they just are bad at the negotiation. And rather than like, like we discussed, actually coming up with a path forward that makes everyone happy, but keeps your report honest they just immediately knock it down like a poltroon they flee from the field of battle that's and that's the problem when you have people who again and maybe we could save this for another episode people who are not subject matter experts and they're you know you have one team saying one person that's leading a team stating that this is how it should be done like there's no way i'm just going to give a scenario there's no way and hell, that a system, I think you were saying there was a system that like re, like uploaded, you uploaded a file and then it reinstates or something with malware and it re up like there's no way in hell that that's, that should be a medium or a downgrade. You know, 
especially if it allows you to do that. That that is a problem. But you have people who don't know what they're talking about, don't know what they're doing, don't even know the system that will tell you that this should be this because they're used to it being a certain way because of that. Or they're saying this is how it's intended to work. Just because something is it may be somebody's intention doesn't make it secure. Right. Yes. Just because you want to say it's a feature doesn't make it secure. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Feature is not an excuse for vulnerability. That's that's one of the dumbest things. I. Thankfully, I haven't heard that very often throughout my career, but I, I know a lot of other people who have. I've heard this so much and me being a developer, you know, I've seen developers do that. Well, yeah, this is a feature. I would have to say just because it's a feature doesn't mean it's secure. Like, and I, you know, I understand that. But being a developer myself, I, I, I see where I know why they say those things. But they, people, that's a, that's a problem. People who are doing development or other fields or other things, they don't understand security. And then you would think some of those people that come over to security would be better at security once you understand it, but they still have the same mindset they had when they were in the other role. Right. Which is why, you know, we get so many bad people. Yeah. Because they don't understand it. I mean, you have people at high levels, C levels, yeah. who don't understand it. But again, this is just going back to what we're we're trying to reinstate. It is not good to downgrade severities. And because your client doesn't want it, they don't like it or they can't take it back, you're, it is the best to negotiate with the client to come to a resolution to solve their problem. Right. Okay, that's the best way to make this happen. Get on a call, talk to them, figure out what their issue is, come up with a solution. I mean, if you went to college or any of that, or be got a computer science degree, engineering, what did you learn? Right. You learned how to solve problems, right? Use it, <laughs> use it. Yes. In the same way with clients, use it. Yes. Yes. And you're not a salesman. It's not your job to capitulate just to make them happy. That's the problem with the salesman with telling everyone, Oh, you're a salesman. Now you feel like you're beholden to the client. I'm not beholden to the client. I'm beholden to all the people who use that data. That's who I'm beholden to. All of the people who own that data, I'm not beholden to the client. The client is just a middleman for the data. I need to make certain that that data is safe and secure. I need to make certain that that data is being appropriately handled and that the trust inherent to this group holding that data is warranted. That's my job. I think if the client did listen more instead of fighting back. Yeah. I mean, you, it, it always is mind boggling to me how if I, I come to you, I say I'm the client, I come to you and I pay you to do a job, but I'm going to tell you how to do your job and not listen to anything you say, but tell you how to do your job and then cry wolf when something happened to me and I get compromised and say, well, you didn't do your job. Yeah. You know, I paid you and you guys didn't do your job. No, you didn't listen. Yes. You didn't want to work with each other to come to us, you know, common ground. You wanted to tell me how to do my job. And I never understand that. What is the point of paying a consulting company to come in and help you fix your problems if you're not going to listen? Right. And I think for all the clients out there, the number one thing you guys can do is listen. If you're going to hire somebody, to advise or consult with you and tell you how to, you know, fix your security posture, at least listen to them, give them a chance, you know, be willing to negotiate. It's, it's, it takes two, yeah. not only on us, it's on you guys as well. That's the only way we can make this work. Otherwise, all you're going to get is, you know, some hostility, nothing's ever going to be resolved and you're just going to come out unhappy, both parties. Yeah. Okay. So, it's not only just for us to negotiate with the client, but it's also for the client to listen and negotiate back. You know, it, it that's, that's just very key to me. Like, I just feel like a lot of clients do not listen. They want you, they want to give you their money to tell you what to do. They don't want to listen to what you, you advise them on. They just want to tell you what they want done, yeah. which is why 
if you don't do what we're saying, most companies out here that are consulting companies or boutiques, small, you will get pushed around. These big companies will push you around because they know you do what the hell they want you to do for the money. Yep. And all you're doing is suckering out for money. Yep. You're a cop out. Yep. Yep. Your Apples, your Microsofts, your Amazons, etc., will push you around and bully you. And if you have the salesman mentality, you will accept it. You will capitulate. You will ruin your reputation and you will risk lawsuits. Yep. So if you don't want that, please listen to what we're saying. Um, this is not the right way. And I've seen, we've seen so many people do this. And eventually, eventually, it will come back to haunt them. Yeah. Maybe not today, maybe not now, but in both sides, it will come back to haunt you. So if you don't want those problems, you don't want ghosts in your closet coming out eventually, or, or what is it, skulls, skeletons in your closet coming out, then don't do the things that we're telling you not to do. So that is our time. I'm Ronnie. I'm Duran. And if you like this episode, please like, comment, subscribe to our channel for more things or more episodes like this one. Until the next time. Have fun.